Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this evening. Let me just get my pen. Um, it's a real delight to see so many people here today to, um, to listen to and then talk about, I hope, what I have thought for a very long time is a pretty important issue and after my last 18 months think is an even more important issue. And I should begin, I suppose, with gratitude to the whole college because uh, when, this, when I was asked to do this, uh, in July of 2010. I had very little time to decide whether I would say yes or no. I spoke to colleagues here who were extremely supportive about it. I, I, I knew I wanted to do it. So at very short notice, uh, we had to arrange for me to spend quite a lot of the first two terms of the year working on this commission. And then I took unpaid leave for last term. So I was away altogether, um, which I hope was extremely difficult for my colleagues and the whole college. Um, <laughs> Rudely, actually, it seems to have been completely fine. It was, um, it was impossible to tell that I was absent, uh, I think. Uh, but anyway, I, I was very grateful for the support that I had from college. And it was the most enormous fun. Uh, it's a pretty difficult set of issues, and I, as I hope will become clear as I go forward. I think there's a great deal to be done. A number of people asked me whether I had completely lost my marbles when I agreed to do this, because it has been a tricky problem for many years. But, but I think, no, it was, it was a chance to, to do some economics again after a few years when I hadn't done very much, and a chance to try to apply economics to an issue that is really very, very important, that goes to the heart, I think, of what it is to be a decent society, which is one of the ambitions that we have for our country. Let me, um, since we are in a university uh, college, I should put up the exam question. This was the exam which we were set. Um, how best to meet the costs of care and support as a partnership between individuals and the state. That's important. We'll come back to that a bit later. How people could choose to protect their assets, especially their homes, against the cost of care. And how both now and in the future public funding for the care and support system can best be used to meet care and support needs. There was one thing in the terms of reference to which I objected, but by that stage it had been approved by Cabinet and so there's nothing to be done about it. And that was in the detailed terms of reference. Uh, we were asked to find a solution to these problems. And now my strong view is that there aren't solutions to very many problems. Most things are about choosing trade-offs. And this is, an, this is another example of, of precisely that, that one has to choose trade-offs. Um, but by then it was too late, so we went forward with it. Now, I want to begin by setting a little bit of the context behind this before I get into the details. And I'm very aware there'll be some people in this room who are professionally expert in this area, some people in this room who've had direct personal experience, and others who are as lay as I was when I began. So I can't, I can't do it exactly right for all of us, and some of it may be repetitive for some of those here. I want to begin, though, with the problem of ageing. So we hear a great deal about the problem of ageing, the way in which our society is ageing. Uh, and here's an example of the kind of data that's often shown. So this is a chart that shows for the next 20 years what's likely to happen to the, to the number of people in different age groups. So people aged 65 to 69, we'll have to see almost a 40% increase in that age group over the next 20 years. 70 to 74 year olds about the same. 80 to 84 year olds about a three quarters increase, 85 plus a doubling. We like to see a doubling in the number of 85 year olds and over, and this is described as the burden of ageing. This seems to me actually quite wrong. This is the marvel of ageing. The great triumph of the last 150 years is that we're living longer. It's fabulous, it's fantastic, it is a great reflection on technological progress, medical progress, economic progress, all kinds of wa wonderful things that mean that we're likely to be alive 5, 10, 15, 20 years later. We've got into a terrible muddle that we describe the fact that people are living longer as a burden. How could it possibly be a burden? It is not in every circumstance, but for most of us something we're quite keen on. We'd like to be alive tomorrow. <laughs> Our whole debate in this area has just got upside down. We should not be talking about the burden of ageing. The challenge of ageing, yes, because there is a challenge in working out how to use our time, our resources, our gifts, and there are challenges for the whole 
economy and thinking about how to allocate resources to cope with it. But the idea that we should think of ageing as a, as a bad thing, that people are living longer as a bad thing, seems to me absolutely back to front and something that uh, in the Commission we've argued very strongly against. A second really important point to note is that we, we're much too easily frightened. So we look at things that are going to change and we worry about how we're going to cope with them. And yet one of the extraordinary things about human societies and economies is they are very flexible. People look forward and they say, oh gosh, frightening increase in the number of older people. It kind of, one has Monty Python-esque images of Hell's grannies coming in, you know, <laughs> laying waste to the society and economy, perhaps a particularly apposite notion for a former women's college uh, where the alumni are still, by and large, ladies. Um, this is, this is crazy. This is where we are now. This is um, 2010. This true the number of people aged over 65 is going to increase over the next little while. That's, this is just the data I showed you a moment ago. But look at what's happened in the last 100 years. The number of older people has increased much more rapidly in the last century than it's about to now. And as far as I'm aware, the economy and society has not fallen apart. We're very, very flexible. We're good at adjusting. And there are even more dramatic numbers than this if you look at the old, old. This is people aged 65 and over. If you look at the number of people aged 85 and over, back in 1901, there were 61,000 people aged 85 and over. Now there are 1.447 million, and soon there are going to be two and a half million. We've seen astonishing ageing, and it's been fine. Of course, there have been some adjustments to be made, and one of the adjustments that hasn't been made is sorting out the social care system. But the idea that, that these kinds of changes are changes we can't cope with is simply wrong. That is what we're good at. We're good at adapting. It's one of the features of human societies. So, core bits of context. Don't think that the fact that people are living longer is a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a fantastic thing. And don't think that because there's change coming, we're doomed. If it was true that the fact that change was coming meant that we're doomed, we'd have been doomed many, many times a year for the last several millennia. We can cope with change, that's what we're good at. Now, before I say much more about the context, let me say a little bit more about the way in which these things work at the moment. So far, I've mainly spoken about ageing, and long-term care of older people was a large part of our job in the Commission, but it wasn't just long-term care of older people. There's also a great deal of care provided to adults of working age, and children, actually, although children were not part of our remit, and that's an issue that we need to think hard about too. How does the current system work? I'll talk just about older people now because that's complicated enough. One of the biggest problems in this debate is that by and large the population believes that long-term care is provided on the same basis as care in the health service. That is that when you need it, it's free. It isn't and it never has been. The social care system is the last vestige of the poor law not in the pejorative sense that people use the phrase poor law, but in the sense that it's still a part of our welfare state provided by local authorities. In 1948, when almost everything else shifted across to central government, care of older people and of working age people with social care needs was left with local authorities. So it's dealt with at the local authority level. It's a local authority responsibility. And whereas health needs are free, these needs are not. If you have social care needs, if you need, need care that is not primarily health related, your local authority has a duty to assess you and see whether you need care. And once they've done that, you're subjected to a means test. There are two types of care, residential care in a residential facility and care in your own home. We'll talk first about residential care, so the kinds of residential care that many people will end up in when they have severe needs. If you need to go into a residential care home, then if you have assets, including the value of your own house, that are worth more than £23,250, you're on your own. You will get no financial support from the state, whatever. An entirely means-tested system, and until you are down to your last £23,250, you look after yourself. Once you get down to your last £23,250, then the state will support you. That's what's led to people's anxiety about selling houses to go into care. As far as care received in your own home, so if you need care but you're still well enough to be in your own home 
uh, the value of your house is not included in the means test, but the provision is still means tested. If you have income beyond a certain level, then you have to pay for yourself. So this is a very different structure to the structure that we have for healthcare in the UK. That's a bit of background. Now let's talk a bit more about how we do things now. Sticking with older people, this is a chart that shows you for England how much we spend, how much public spending there is on older people. We spend about £85 billion pounds a year on social security benefits for older people, about £50 billion pounds on healthcare for older people, and about £8 billion, pounds, just 6% of the total spend goes on social care. And we'll come back to this later because I have no doubt in my mind that if we started with an empty bar, if we just decided we were going to allocate £150 billion pounds of public spending to older people, we would not draw those intermediate lines where they are at the moment. Those of you who have any experience in the health service will know that most of what the health service does is look after older people. Between two-thirds and three-quarters of the activity in the health service is looking after older people. And looking after older people in hospitals is a very, very expensive thing to do. We do much too much of that and much too little social care. Oxford's a classic example where there is a terrible bed blocking problem at the moment. We haven't got the interaction between these three bits anything like right. It's also worth noting that there's enormous pressure in this area. Um, this, the top line, the line that says demand, simply shows what's happened to the numbers of people needing care just as a result of the ageing of the population. This line shows what's happened to local authority spending on social care for the elderly since 2005-06. Now, I cheated by um, having the two lines slant at the same point. I've no idea whether in 2005-06 we were spending enough in local authorities adequately to look after older people in the social care system. I rather suspect we weren't. But what I can say is that since 2005-06, the gap between what's needed and what's being provided has certainly grown. There is enormous pressure on this system at the moment, as I suspect some people in this room may know as a result of their own experiences of trying to get care for people who they want looked after. So the background is there is enormous pressure and we have a system that is not working well, a system that leaves people anxious for reasons I'll say more about in a moment. When we began our work, uh, we spent about three or four months just talking to one another. Uh, we didn't write anything very much down, and I could see that my, my colleagues on the Secretariat, who were professional civil servants, were getting more and more nervous because they really thought that we should have produced some papers. Um, and we did, and they were, I, sh I should say, they were fantastic. It was an extraordinary privilege to work with people of such ability and commitment. But we spent that time just trying to work out how to frame the problem, how to think about this problem. Because we have people saying things like that it's very unfair that people have to sell their houses. Um, well, we weren't quite sure why it was unfair. So this is how we framed the problem. Um, this is my favourite chart of the last two years. And it took an astonishing amount of effort to get this data together. Um, I'll explain why in a moment. What this chart shows is imagine that you're 65, um, which for some of us is something we're looking forward to, for some of us something that we're looking back at, and, um, but anyway, imagine that you're 65. This shows what the likely level of spend you'll have before your death on care will be. About a quarter of 65-year-olds will die before they have any care needs at all. And in some cases that will be after a very lengthy life, I'm in their late 90s, suddenly a heart attack, and they go from a completely independent life to being dead without any care needs. Um, some of the people down here will be people who are unfortunate and die very quickly after their 60th birthday in accident. Only a quarter of us at the age of 65 can expect to reach the end of our lives without some identifiable need to spend on care. Halfway up the distribution, £20,000. So half of us can expect to have care needs of less than £20,000 before we die, half of us more. <coughs> but then things start rising very, very dramatically indeed. By the time you're into the top 20%, we're talking about care needs of £70,000. The top 10%, we're talking about £100,000. And it can be a quarter of a million or even more. 
Why, why was I so keen to get this data? Well, because this seems to tell me precisely what we need to know when we're thinking about planning. It was difficult to get because, because this is a local authority responsibility, there, was, there is no national data on all of this. To produce this chart took months of laborious statistical work, getting data from all kinds of places, and as you can see there are a few blips where I don't think we quite managed to <coughs> smooth it out as ideally as we might. Um, this shape is really important to understand. Most things don't have this kind of shape. If you think to yourself, what would the, if we drew this line for food spending, what would it look like? And for food spending, it would look like this. There will be some people with very low food spending beyond the age of 65 because they didn't live very long. And there'll be some people with higher food spending because they lived a long time. But the only reason it would be higher is that they'd lived a long time. They wouldn't be this shooting off like this. The same way with housing expenditure. Uh, it would tend to go like this. Because it's predictable. We know what our housing expenditure will be per year. There are some other things that have this kind of shape. So healthcare costs have this kind of shape. Some people are lucky. They'll have very little healthcare need. Some people will have intermediate health care need, and then some people will have very severe health care need. Uh, the consequence of your house being burgled or burning down looks like this. Some of us will be lucky and never have, never have an incident like that. Some of us will have a small incident. I had my bicycle stolen again at the station last week. Very irritating. <laughs> down here in terms of money, but actually up here in terms of irritation. All of my liberal, of my liberal instincts disappear when my bicycle gets stolen. Um, but some, some people's house will burn down. Uh, motor car problems are a bit like this. So. Uh, these are sensible women drivers. <laughs> These are boys showing off and scratching their cars while doing so. These are women being driven into by idiot boys. <laughs> <laughs> Those three examples are really important. Because what we do in all of those cases is we look at the chart this shape and we say, I really don't like that. I really do not wish to take the risk of ending up here. And what we do in those three cases is so say, well, we'll take this shape and we'll squash it and we'll spread it out. And we'll all pay this much. In the National Health Service, we do that through taxation. We take the shape, we squash it down, we say, we're all going to pay. And it's true that those of us down here will end up paying more than we would have paid if there wasn't the National Health Service. But we're willing to pay it because we'd rather do that than end up here. But it's not just the public sector where we do this. I suspect everybody in this room who drives has got car insurance. I hope so, because if you haven't, you're breaking the law. Um, as far as our car insurance is concerned, again, we take this and squash it down. Not very much if you're a young boy. We squash it down and we spread it out. Everybody in this room will have insurance against the house off map that they do <coughs> down. Again, we do the same thing. We take these extreme risks, we squash them down, we spread them out. It's called risk pooling. It's a very natural human inclination. Faced by an extreme risk, we spread it out. This area, long-term care, is the only big risk that we all face where there's no risk pooling. It's absolutely unbelievably nuts that there is a very large risk facing most of us, three quarters of us, are going to have care needs before our death, and that number is rising. And in some cases it's going to be very large, and we are entirely unprepared. We have no way of coping with the risk. And that's a very, very serious matter. It's a serious matter because what it does is creates fear. So that the common narrative that came up in all of the responses to our consultation is that people were frightened. And they're right to be frightened. This is almost my favourite chart. In fact, there have been occasions in the last few months when it has been my favourite chart. Um, so along the bottom, we've got people's starting level assets. And up this axis, we've got what proportion of those assets they would lose if they have a long-term care need. And ignore these two lower um, wave-shaped wave things. We'll just look at the top one, which is 
um, somebody who has a lifetime care need of £150,000, which is precisely what people are worried about. That's what might happen if you end up being in a residential care home for six or seven years. These vertical lines are different points in the distribution of wealth. So this is 5% up the homeowner wealth distribution, the poorest 1 20th. This is a quarter from the bottom of the wealth distribution. This is the median of the wealth distribution. This is the 75th centile. And this is the 95th centile. So 5% of the population is richer than that. Under the current regime, if you've got less than £23,000, then you don't lose any of your assets. But then very quickly, through a 100% market tax rate in the mean stage, you do. So the person at the fifth centile, so 1 20th of the way up the wealth distribution, will lose 75% of all of the assets that they've ever accumulated. The person at the median will lose 87% of all of the assets that they've ever accumulated. Now, is it unfair that people have to sell their houses? Well, that seems to me the wrong thing to think. It's not unfair that people should make a contribution <coughs> towards the care that they need. But this system is nuts because it's denying people any opportunity to spread the risk, any opportunity to get control. And as a result of that, we find people terrified. We find this group in the bottom half of the wealth distribution. Hoarding assets, so sitting very, very worried that they'll end up in the tail end risk, and so not being willing to spend any money on sensible adaptations of their house, moving house, putting in a stair lift, putting in a handrail, taking preventive action, because they feel they have no control. So this is what we were fighting against. And the reason we're fighting against it is we have this, this unpooled risk. So what can you do? Well, economics is very simple. So there are two simple responses. One thing will be to say, well, why don't we do what we've done in the health service? Which is we just take hold of this risk and we deal with it through the state. So we take the risk away from people, we increase the tax burden to pay for it. That was what the Royal Commission on this subject in 1999 recommended. Royal Commission chaired by Lord Sutherland. Um, it didn't happen then. And we're not recommending it. There are two reasons that we're not recommending it. The first is that if it was <coughs> ever going to happen, 1999 was when it was going to happen. In 1999, we had a Labour government with an enormous majority, and we had the public finances unexpectedly moving from deficit into surplus. If there was ever a time when it might have been agreed to, that was it. We didn't get even close then. But that's not the real reason why we don't recommend it. This is a structure that people have to believe will be in place for not 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or even 40 years, but more than that. Now, I'm 51. My grandmother is 103 at the end of this month. And, you know, I hope I won't need care until I'm as old as she is. That's an unthinkably long way away. So we have to have a system, if it's to work, that we believe will last for that length of time. There are some countries that have just tried to put this all into the state. Uh, Germany and Japan have done that very recently. And it turns out that as soon as the public finances become difficult, this is the first thing that gets squeezed. The very first thing that gets squeezed. And so amounts of payout are reduced and you end up with the worst possible world that people have thought that their risk had been pulled through state provision and it turns out that it hasn't been. So we're not recommending that the state takes the whole lot on. Had we recommended it, it certainly wouldn't have happened. But even if it had happened, it wouldn't, in our view, have lasted. And it's absolutely vital that we have something that lasts. Here. So if we, don't, we can't give all this to the state, why don't we just give it all to the private sector? That's what we do with car insurance and house insurance. Why don't we have a voluntary private insurance scheme? Well, the reason for that is that um, the private sector will not take it on. And they won't take it on for the very, very good reason. Now, I can draw this picture for 2011. I've got no idea what it will look like in 20 years' time. And if I was a, so if I was a private sector financial services institution, insurance company, and any of you came to me and said, come on, sell me some insurance against this risk, I'd say no, because I just don't know what it might cost me. And if you look all around the world, there is no country where there is a thriving voluntary private insurance market for this, for just that reason. There have been attempts in both the UK and the US to make this work, and they've fallen apart. 
You can buy some insurance in the United States for long-term care, um, but, the amount, but the amounts that it will pay out are capped. So you can buy insurance, and it will pay out, it will pay out for four years. Well, but that's precisely the reason you want to get insurance is because of the tail end risk. And that's precisely what the insurers perfectly reasonably will not do. So just giving it to the private sector doesn't work. Now, this is difficult for an economist because we like simple solutions, uh, and, and the two simple solutions are infeasible. We can't just give it to the state, and we can't just give it to the private sector. So the question becomes, is there a way of splitting this risk between the public and private sectors such that people are protected from the extreme risk and from the fear that goes with it, and we have the chance of getting a private sector market going? There was a suggestion made about five or six years ago that what should happen is we should split the risk in this way. So the state should take half of it, and the private sector should take half of it. That was an early form of partnership suggestion. That seems sensible, it seems kind of fair that everybody's having to make a contribution. The trouble with it is that um, half of an almost infinite amount is still an almost infinite amount. And so if all you do is take away half of the tail end risk, then you're still leaving people with what would for many of them be a catastrophic risk. And it's also the case that if you're expecting the private sector to take, to take half of a catastrophic risk, they're likely to say, well, half of an enormous amount of uncertainty is still more uncertainty than we want to go for. And indeed, that was their view. So that, that suggestion, while not ludicrous, in my view, is not the right thing to do. Our commission's suggestion is this, that what we should do is the state should take the tail end risk, so this light pink block, and clearly the bit that, that matters most is, is the bit right at the very end. Uh, what, our, what we suggested is that the state should take everything beyond £35,000. So that individuals would still be responsible for the first £35,000 of their cumulative care needs, <laughs> which would mean that nearly three quarters, two thirds to three quarters of people would still be entirely left to their own devices. But that everybody would know that if it turned out that they were in this tail end of the risk, if it turned out they were one of the least fortunate who had very high care needs, then they would be provided for. So this is a bit like an insurance policy with a large excess. So we all, when we take out insurance policies, there's an excess to them, typically three, four, five hundred pounds. Well, this is an insurance policy with a 35,000 pounds excess. So the government is saying, we'll provide you insurance, this bit of the insurance that the private sector simply cannot provide, but we're leaving you with that first slab. What does that do to the charts I showed earlier? Well, this was the, this, this light grey thing is the current system. This is what happens once you put a £35,000 cap on people's liabilities in place. You can see for the person at the median, we move from losing 87% of assets down to about 20%. It's a big improvement for the person a quarter of the way out of the income distribution, wealth distribution, but still for the person at the very bottom, things don't look great. And that's because of the way that the means tested system works. Let me talk a bit about that now. I've spent 30 years working on the British welfare state. Uh, so I've looked at a lot of means tests. There are means tests all over the British welfare state. Housing benefit, council tax benefit, uh, supplementary benefit as was, income support as now is, the, f the working families tax, all over the place there are means tests. And means tests are not, in my view, always a bad thing. They can be a perfectly appropriate way of trying to target resources on those who need them most. But some of them are not well designed. And the means test which wins the prize for the worst <laughs> British means test is the means test in the social care system. I'm a, I'm a real stickler for precision in how we describe the functioning of means tests. And we had lengthy debates in the meetings of our commission. This is how it works at the moment. If you have less than £14,000 of assets, you, you get complete support. Between £14,000 and £23,250, the amount of support is reduced. And then at £23,250 and a penny, well, it disappears. Now, people talk loosely about cliff edges in um, Social Security and other bits of welfare state and means tests. I think often much too loosely. But even I, 
reckon that you probably could call that a cliff edge. It is fairly abrupt. And remember that this is, this is a system where the charges can be £25,000 a year. So you're moving from receiving all £25,000 a year here to receiving between £25,000 and £22,000 here to receiving nothing at this point. It generates feelings of unfairness. It's clearly inefficient. And perhaps worst of all, it creates a massive incentive to cheat. Now, cheating is always wrong. Cheating is something that should never be done. But a system that encourages people to cheat is a bad system. And the particular form of cheating this encourages is for people to alienate their assets, to give their assets away to other members of the family, so they appear not to have any wealth. And it's extremely, extremely corrosive of, of general attitudes towards <coughs> the system. What should be done? Well, this figure here, the 23,250, should be stretched to 100,000 pounds, which would mean that we would get a much, a much more sensible uh, tapering down of support. It's not terribly expensive to do because, of course, there aren't terribly many people with assets of this kind of level, but the few there are feel very, very bad about the system. What does that do? Well, that was, that was what it looked like before. The interaction of the change in the upper assets threshold, the means test and the cap, means that we take that red bit away. And this is, this is what we get as a result of our final set of proposals. But nobody risks losing more than 30% of their assets. Now, some people have, have said to me, well, you know, you're just protecting people's inheritances. Why would you be protecting people's inheritances? I think there are two responses to that. The first, and I think the most important, is that it's not the case that the beginning of people's care journey is the end of their lives. Many people lead fruitful, enjoyable, worthwhile lives for many, many years after they start to need care. The beginning of care is not death. It's just the beginning of another phase of your life. And during that phase of your life, you need just as much control, just as much grasp and power over your life as you do at any other phase of your life. It's simply not right to think that just because somebody has a care need, they have no need for economic or other independence. The second point to make is that it will be possible to describe the National Health Service as a grand scheme for protecting inheritances, because indeed it does do that. In the absence of a National Health Service, then people who became very ill would not have anything to leave to their successors. But we don't describe the National Health Service as a way of protecting people inherit people's inheritances. We describe the National Health Service as a way of protecting people's health. The social care system, it seems to me, is about looking after people's care needs. And we certainly shouldn't use it as a substitute for an inheritance tax. Not least because only one person in ten ends up suffering through the social care system. We shouldn't have a, an inheritance tax that hits a random draw of one person in ten who happens to have high social care needs. If we think we should tax inheritances more severely, and that's a perfectly plausible view, we should tax inheritances more severely. If we think that the tax system overall should be more progressive, we should make the tax system more progressive. The tax system overall raises £700 billion a year. The social care system for the elderly spends £8 billion a year. We should not use the social care system to try to do the job of the tax system. Now, I've shown lots of charts. Some people um, like numbers more than charts, so I'll, I'll put this up as well. What, what this shows is effectively what was on the last chart. If, for, for different starting levels of wealth, uh, and it's hard to imagine in the bourgeois surroundings of Oxford that there might be people with levels of wealth like this, with houses that might... But actually, there are parts of the country where it's perfectly plausible for uh, an elderly person living on his or her own in a small flat to have that kind of level of wealth. The consequence of our proposals is that the maximum that they can spend on care would be these amounts. If we didn't make the change that I described to the means test, then all of these numbers are right at £35,000. <laughs> and these should be compared to, under the current regime, this number minus £23,000. So under the current regime, here it would be 17000 27000 uh, 47000 77000 127,000 is what people could end up spending on care as things are at the moment. Now, so far, I've talked entirely about older people. 
Well, I did say at the beginning that it isn't just older people uh, on whom our, our work had to be done. There is a serious issue too about uh, the care of people of working age who have care and support needs. Now the reason that we think it's reasonable that we should all pay 30, the first £35,000 of our care costs is that having a care need is relatively predictable for most of us. As we grow older, we're very likely to have care needs in just the same way as we're very likely to have housing needs and food needs. And so it seems reasonable to expect us all to prepare for that, but not for the tail end risk. Is it reasonable to say to somebody who reaches adulthood with an already established care and support need that she or he should have made financial provision for that? Well, plainly not. Uh, if, you've, if, you've, if you reach adulthood already having a care and support need, then that seems to me to be a risk that should be pulled across the whole population, and your care, I think, should simply be free. So our starting point was to say, well, the cap should be naught for people at the age of 18. We thought some more about it and ended up taking the position that the cap should continue to be zero until the middle of people's working lives. Because if you're unfortunate enough to have a care and support need established in the first half of your working life, then first of all, that's, a very, that's an unlikely event and so appropriate for pooling across the whole distribution. And secondly, in the first half of people's working lives, by and large, they don't accumulate assets. They're often still net debtors by the middle of their working lives. So our suggestion is that for people under the age of 40, care should simply be free. Uh, for people as they get older, depending on when their care school needs is established, the cap should certainly rise until it reaches £35,000 for those aged 65 and over. Now, I'm not going to talk about living costs now, although if somebody wants to ask me a question about that later, I'm very happy to answer it. There's been a lot of discussion about whether, whether we can afford this. Um, that seems to me simply a category error. We are four times as well off as we were 50 years ago. The question about anything to do with what we do as a government is not really can we afford it, but do we choose to do it? Uh, we can choose to do whatever we want. We could choose to have very significantly lower taxation and more responsibilities on individuals. We could choose to have higher taxation and lower responsibilities on individuals to look after themselves directly. We can make whatever choices we want. Affordability is sloppy language in this area. It just doesn't make sense to say, can the state afford to do something? The state can decide what it wants to do. <coughs> so affordability is not the right question. Is it good value for money? Is it something that we want to do? Well, this, this is a chart that shows you uh, there's one grey box for every billion pounds of public spending. Now, I'm sorry that I've chosen grey, because I don't <coughs> think grey is the wrong colour for public spending. Public spending does marvellous things. Um, you know, and that's, I'm not making a political statement. That's, that's believed by politicians of all sides. Politicians on the right and on the left, they're, they're in politics because they recognise that there are many things that we need to do together. And many of those are marvellous, beautiful things. Now, the health service can be a marvellous, beautiful thing. I've been to lots of care settings where fabulous work is being done by outstanding people. Anyway, so I'm sorry if this is grey, because many parts of public spending, including education, shouldn't be, shouldn't be coloured grey, they should be coloured, you know, multi multicoloured, rainbow coloured. Um, here are some of the things we spend money on. We spend £103 billion pounds on the health service. I should, I, should, I, should give you a, I should give you an easy metric, because billion doesn't really mean anything to most people. Um, 60 billion pounds is a thousand pounds each a year. So 60 billion is a thousand pounds each. We spend about 18 or 1900 pounds for every person in the UK in the health service. We spend about 1350 pounds on social security benefits for, benefits for older people for every single one of the people in the UK. We spend about uh, 750 pounds on defence for each of us, at almost exactly £1,000 per person on education. Social care for those working age and older people, and disability benefits for adults, which I haven't talked about, we spend £27 billion. The cost of the reforms that I've just described rounded up to £2 billion, actually £1.7 billion a year, one four hundredth of public spending. And in fact, during this, this Parliament, because it takes a while for these... Um, measures to be introduced and to bed down. We're talking about low hundreds of millions of pounds. This seems to me like 
a very, very small amount of money. Now, of course, the public finances are in a model. They're in more of a model than they've been at any time in the 30 years that I've been paying attention to it. So it's not an easy thing for government to make a change, even as small as this. But it does seem to me, I feel this very, very strongly, that we have to believe that as a society, as a country, as a government, we are capable of making changes of this scale. A reallocation of one four hundredth of public spending, of one eight hundredth of the national economy. You know, if, we, if we really can't do that by either reallocating a bit of public spending from elsewhere or increasing tax by that amount, then we have a pretty low view of our capability for making change. So I think we can do it, and I think we jolly well should. There are some other things that I, I haven't got time to talk about at great length now. One is we definitely need to improve information and advice. It may be that most people in this room came with some understanding of how the system works at the moment, but I'd be surprised. And certainly amongst the population at large, there is very little understanding of how the system works. My own view is that the, a large part of the reason for that is it's an embarrassment. Uh, no local government politician or central government politician actually wants to stand up and talk about this because it's such a shambles. And if we had a better system, then we'd have more chance of it being better understood. But it really is terribly important that it is better understood. The uh, roughly 100,000 people a year who find themselves unexpectedly needing to get involved in this system, many of them are astonished and extremely distressed when faced by what it actually means, and that's not a sensible place to be. Second thing we need is much better information and need assessments for carers, by which I mean informal, unpaid carers, who are the, the deliverers of almost, well, certainly the great bulk of care in the UK. Most care is provided informally, and most of that is provided by women. This is an archetypal example of an issue where women bear the brunt of what's going on. Um, this may sound flippant, although it's not meant to be. Um, the probability of, a, of a, the, my probability of ending up in residential care is about one in five. My wife Catherine's is about one in three. And that's partly because I am a little bit older than Catherine, and so and that tends to be true, that in general men tend to be older than their partners and so become frail sooner when it's more likely that their wives or partners may be able to look after them. But it's also because men are useless and women aren't. Um, so the burden of caring falls astonishingly disproportionately on women. It tends to be daughters and daughters-in-law who look after the older generation. It tends to be wives who look after husbands and not vice versa. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is so important, but actually also why it's politically quite salient. <coughs> the way in which carers are supported and assessed at the moment is a nonsense. Um, there is an entitlement to an assessment. It can take months and months. It is often not done until months and months after the assessment of the cared for person. And then when it's done, you're told that there's nothing that can be done, which isn't overwhelmingly encouraging. Another very important set of issues is about portability and um, national eligibility thresholds. Because this is a local authority function at the moment, there's no portability in your eligibility. So if you want to move from one part of the country to another, I mean, you can move, but your entitlement to care stops until you've been reassessed in your no new local authority. This matters actually probably even more for working age people with care needs than it does for older people with care needs, although it matters for them too. This is nuts. And again, we had absolutely unanimous response from those we talked to about this, that this needed to stop, including from the large local government associations that the local, local authorities, they all recognise that this simply has to stop. And then finally, we do need much better integration of health and social care. Uh, on average, well, these costings are tricky, but on average it looks at that it can cost £3,000 a week to keep an older person in hospital. It can cost half of that to keep them in one of the nicest residential care homes in the country, where they'll also be better looked after. The fact that we don't have pooled budgets across health and social care, that social care is a local authority issue, that health is a health service issue, call, does, does lead to all sorts of trouble. And then lastly, let me talk a bit about the financial services sector. Um, the financial services sector has not had a good press in the last 
few decades. I think some of that has been very unfair. And actually, almost everybody in this room has benefited enormously from the British financial services industry. We rely on them for our banking services. Most of us rely on them for our pensions. We've relied on them for house purchase. There are many things that they do well. At the moment, they are locked out of this market because there's, there's simply no way they will tackle this tailored risk. Once we have a system like the one that I've described in place, then we will have created a, a world where the financial services sector can become involved. And there are all kinds of ways in which I think they might become involved. I think we'll see better equity release products because people will now know how much money they need to take out. I also think probably most importantly that we'll start to see this as just one part of our retirement planning. The moment we, we plan for our retirement and we take our pensions very, very seriously, but we have at least one eye shut because when we take our pension, we think that it's going to be all right to have an income that does this, that is just flat during our retirement. And you know, we have got at least one eye shut because there's a one in three chance that we're going to need to spend more than £35,000 on our care needs. And the fact that we're not taking that into account in our planning is crazy. Once we have a system like this in place, then it will be possible to do that. There's a, I'll digress briefly. On, I should, I, I'm, a, I'm an enemy <coughs> fellow of the Institute of Actuaries. I, I think actuarial matters are really very, very interesting. Um, and so I try to explain one example of, of the way in which they're very, very interesting. Um, the probability of needing long-term care and the probability of dying are negatively correlated. So on average, once you have a care need, you're going to die sooner. And that means that there's something called a disability-linked annuity, which in this new world will be feasible and I think very attractive. Imagine that you could take a pension that was going to be £10,000 a year. The trouble with doing that is that's fine until you have a care need. Then when you have a care need, it's nothing like enough. An alternative would be to take uh, an annuity not of £10,000 a year, but of £9,000 a year. But then, once you had a care need, it would jump up to £27,000 a year. That's working off the, the negative correlation of these two risks. Those kinds of products, I think, will become available, and I think in generations to come, that's what we'll see. If we get all of these things, what's the prize? Well, the big prize is older people at their most vulnerable stage being less frightened. And that's a really, really big prize. It's a pretty terrible thing to do to people in their older years when they are feeling vulnerable to leave them feeling as though they have no control. More exciting even than that, I think once we have these kinds of systems in place, we'll move away from the, the sort of market we have for care at the moment, which is not at all diverse and where the quality is nothing like what it should be, to a market where there's much greater diversity, where consumers, all of us, feel far more engaged, where we start looking forward for how we're going to manage our older lives. And as we do that, we'll create ways of looking after and being looked after that will work much more effectively than the ways that we have at the moment. There's a chance of seeing these years of our lives not as something ghastly and to be endured, but as something to manage and in which to create something that can be really effective and enjoyable. That's a perfectly realistic possibility and I think we have a chance of getting there. What's happening now? Uh, we reported on the 4th of July. Um, there, there's been by and large a pretty positive response. We have, we have a consensus across all of the interested parties that I don't think we've ever seen before. Uh, all of the big charities, Age UK, Carers UK, the Alzheimer's Society, all of these have come out in support. So has the financial services industry. I was this morning at a meeting of the Association of British Insurers, who themselves have come out fully in favour. Uh, the media has been pretty positive. The politicians have been as positive as they ever are. Um, actually, probably, no, more positive than they often are uh, across all three parties. There are cross-party talks going on as we speak. The government has announced another consultation exercise. Now, it would, wouldn't be completely ludicrous to say, wasn't that what I was doing? And indeed, I did spend a year um, consulting widely. But it doesn't seem to me unreasonable for the government to make sure that um, I wasn't lying about what people said. So there, there, there's a consultation exercise going on at the moment, which finishes early next month. And there's been the promise of a white paper in April of next year. Uh, the House of Commons Health Select Committee is doing an inquiry at the moment. There was this afternoon uh, a Westminster Hall debate about all of this. 
I think it's finely balanced. Um, in my more optimistic moments, I think there's an 80% chance that we'll get a white paper that is bold and courageous. Uh, and in my less optimistic moments, I think the chances are smaller than that. The thing that will make it happen uh, will, in the end, be politics. There was, a, there was a huge amount of interest in this in July. It tailed off through August and the first parts of September. We're now again beginning to hear about inadequate care of older people in hospitals, anxieties about care homes. Uh, this is a politically salient matter. Uh, we're also able to look back to the government's coalition agreement. There's some of the details of which I suspect the government may in the end regret. But anyway, they signed it and they wrote it. And in the coalition agreement, there are very strong words about the need to, resort, to sort out this system to increase the quality of care and to reduce the financial burdens on families. So my own feeling is that the government has little choice but to take this forward. But there's still quite a lot of work to be done. And in particular, one sense that I had more clearly through the year that I worked on this than I'd had before was how ludicrously busy we ask our politicians to be. The pressures on ministers seem to me simply absurd. Absolutely crazy. They are kind of mince, mince machines through which we press stuff. And the stuff that gets to the top of the agenda is not always the stuff that is most important. We need to get this back up to the top of the agenda. Uh, and that's a job that needs to be done by the population as a whole. It can only be done by the population as a whole, by the press. My own hope is that we're all people who live in a country where we really, really do care about how people are looked after. And perhaps this is the, the thing on which to end. I've approached this using the tools of economics. And, and my own belief is that by setting this up as an economic problem, we got to a very simple way of thinking about it and a way of thinking about it that, that allowed a way forward. But it's very important to realise that economics can do that job for us, but what it can't do for us is explain why we care. Actually, looking after people, whether old or young, with very severe social care needs is not good for the economy. It's quite expensive and it's a drag on the economy. But it's right. And economics can't tell us what's right, can't tell us what it is that we should be trying to do. It can tell us how to do the things that we want to do because they're right. And it can do that astonishingly effectively. I believe really passionately that this economic analysis actually tells us much more clearly than we've understood before how we should do this. But it doesn't tell us what we should do or what we should be trying to do. For that, we need to look to different kinds of analysis. And what we mustn't do is confuse these two and try to think that we should be doing social care to try to make the economy run more efficiently, or that economic efficiency is the mark of a good response to social care. The reason that we're doing this is because we're looking after people who matter intrinsically in their own right. And all a grubby economist can do is try and work out how to do it. Thank you very much.